I'm Julie Alexandria. And I'm Jennifer Mercedes. Between the two of us, we have over two decades of experience working in professional sports. We're telling the stories of women who are at the top of their game in sports and business. Welcome to the locker room. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have a special guest, Lonnie Murray, who, as the Wall Street Journal put it, is a rare Black female in Major League Baseball, stands out in nearly every professional crowd. Lonnie is a CEO at Sports Management Partners and the embodiment of what it is to be a hard worker working woman in the industry. Lonnie, welcome. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Now, you were always you. Yeah, no, <laughs> you were always into sports and knew that somehow you'd end up uh, working in the industry. But did you ever see yourself as a player agent? No. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I, you know, it's just a uh, parenting extended. <laughs> How, how did how how was that process like for you? Um, the process of becoming an agent. Yeah, Just from where you started to 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 where you and en you've ended up. Yeah. From where I started, it was really just advocating for, you know, players, whether it was, you know, with marketing deals or um, you know, situations that would occur with their team on behalf of the agent. And then when they started relying on me more heavily and I started sitting in on contract meetings or negotiations and um, even arbitrations, then the player was typically reliant or would ultimately become reliant on my opinion. And so when I, I don't just regurgitate what I'm heard, what I'm told. And so for me, I want to know, you know, what the contract says, what all the details are, all the nuances so that I can, you know, explain it in a way that the player actually understands without over talking them or their family. And so that led to, well, why am I not just doing this on my own, you know, having my own players, et cetera. So when your husband, Dave Stewart, left the company to become the GM of the Arizona Diamondbacks, you were left with some very difficult decisions to make. Looking back on it now, do you feel that you made the right choice and would you have done anything differently? Absolutely made the right choice. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. I think when people are together for a really long time, um, you there's a lot of times you're happy, like, you go do what you got to do. I got this. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's real. Um, but at the same time, my relationships with players, there was no, I could not get my head around leaving them. At the same time, you know, I've got, you know, two sons. I had, you know, one son who I adopted in the sixth grade and they're the same age. I have a, a, a girl, you know, a young girl living with me that's getting ready to graduate high school that I'm calling my daughter and she wants to go off ultimately to veterinary school. So for me, I provided this, you know, seemingly stable environment. And now I'm either going to uproot them in, you know, just the disruption to their whole life or um, I'm going to continue right here what I'm doing, which is what a lot of people don't understand, is that I was actually doing the work before David went on to the deep backs, which is why it caused the industry even to be a little bit like, oh my God, you know, she took over so that they can keep pocketing money while David goes off and pockets money with the deep backs. And it's like, you don't know me, <laughs> you know, because the truth is, I've been doing this. I, I had been certified since 2008. So mm -hmm. it was, um, that was the argument. In addition, you know, I think it also sends a very bad message to women when, um, and mind you, there were many women that also questioned it, but how do you tell a woman that she can't continue to do what she's doing for a living because daddy goes off and gets his dream job? Mm -hmm. Really? That, you know, but those that know me, um, fortunately within the industry, um, when rumors or when, you know, the, the gossip would start amongst them at least, and I think Sylvia Lynn says, says it best, you know, you clearly don't know Lonnie. <laughs> you know? She doesn't listen to, you know, uh, you know, she kind of marches to the beat of her own drum, so. 
Well, marching to the beat of your own drum, and and I think what you said is really important, is that even other women question it, but I think other women may, may have questioned it because they haven't seen it done. And then you, so you provided that template, right? That it can be done. Uh, you just need to give us the opportunity to do that or uh, create our own opportunities. And, and, and that's, that's what has happened. Now, for a long time, stereotypes have long permeated the way certain players are scouted. You, on the other hand, when you hear those stereotypical descriptions of specific players, black and brown players, uh, you see potential. Why? Uh, well, I've been on the receiving end of misguided stereotypes, and um, I, I, I don't believe that you can look at a player no, uh, and evaluate them with just your eyes. And, you know, for example, if you're just timing them down, running down the first baseline, if you're just watching to see how long it takes their ball to, to drop in the air. If you're just, you know, looking one day, one snapshot of performance, you know, which is what most guys are out there doing, you're going to miss not being able to look a bit further at body language, at, you know, seeing how somebody they might be connecting with in the stands. All, in, and I know that sounds crazy, but all of these little intangible things that aren't necessarily measured on average play a role in how you evaluate that player. Mm -hmm. um, no different than, you know, you have a player, there was a situation where a player goes in and he sets up for a scout meeting, which you should get dressed nice for. The scout then returns and says, the kid didn't even get dressed up for me. Well, the kid had on khaki shorts and a pair of Jordans. So you ask him, what did he have on? Khaki shorts and a pair of Jordans. Okay, what, did, what neighborhood does the kid live in? That kid got dressed up. He wore the Jordans he's kept in a box for two years for you. Those sorts of things, and why, which is, you know, plays into the diversity of the sport, not just in black and brown, but also in male and female. Because even you guys would be able, kids or no kids, yeah, we have an innate intuition that I'm sorry, but that God just blessed us with that said, allows no. us to look past the moment or past the surface of what we're supposed to be evaluating and actually evaluating on a holistic scale. And that's what you can make a, a mediocre player. Great. A mediocre player with a lot of heart. Great. You can't take a great player player a guy with tools who has no heart and make him great mm -hmm. ultimately he's gonna suck and mm -hmm. i'm not gonna want to deal with him <laughs> And yeah. that is why it has to go beyond sabermetrics. Yes. That is why it is so much more than balls and strikes and numbers on a scouting report, because there is so much more that goes into it. A lot of people are critical of MLB saying that they have a marketing problem. Does MLB, in your opinion, need to do a better job specifically of marketing black and brown, black and Latino players? Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't want and I so MLB has a problem with diversity or attracting diversity going out and and I'm sorry are, are we just are we able to be just really blunt yes please okay. please going out and pimping out the seven black players that you have or the most popular brown players that you have and thinking that that's going to change the trajectory of the situation is wrong. Mm -hmm. I would rather you see, I would rather see you take those same marketing dollars that you're using for breakthrough series or the dream series, same marketing dollars that you're using on those events that only take place X number limited times per year and put that money into actually developing players in, in underserved communities. How about that? Now, it's interesting that you that you mentioned that, and, and as far as, you know, pimping out the, the players, I mean, you had one player who was the target, and I, I mean, I believe became a scapegoat, right? Um, throughout the beginnings of the, the BLM movement and was attacked 
how do you deal with those things? How do you deal with somebody who was basically blacklisted in baseball? If not for, if not for last year, I don't think he'd be even close to, to having a position back in major league baseball, right? No, he would. Cause I don't play that. So <laughs> here's what actually happened. Um, Bruce went through that situation prior to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. But we all saw it when it happened. And I remember like jumping up out of my seat, like, Oh my God. And in Oakland, like that was huge and so incredibly symbolic. And that still to this days goes so missed by so many people that it was Oakland of all places that this young man had the bravery to take a knee. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know is in that one year after the, the downward spiral that took place with that player. And I too feel guilty for not even considering what the backlash he could have potentially been receiving. Mm -hmm. So then I get the opportunity where it's like, hey, you know, Bruce Maxwell wants to sit down and it's like, hell no. And the reason I said hell no is because there were some things that took place after. I didn't know the whole story. I only knew what happened on TV. Shame on me because I, he wants to sit down. I, I pretty much sit down with everybody. I, I try to play hard, but I'm not. Um, and so I sit down with him and here walks in this big baby Huey. <laughs> and, you know, he's like, can't make eye contact with me, but not in a dishonest way. I, I knew, I, you know, I have a tendency to to intimidate or as the boys call it, scare people sometimes. <laughs> um, so we sit down and I'm, you know, asking him, he makes his five minute spiel and then I'm asking him question after question and it gets really emotional. And then now the dots are connecting and he tells me a story and that was just so far beyond comprehension that it didn't seem true. But I also felt in my heart of hearts that he was telling the truth. And so it was like, okay, then I need you to give me permission to see, to speak to your attorney, see all of the records and just full uh, disclosure. He gave me permission over the course of the next two days. The things that I read include were so grossly egregious that no one stepped up for Bruce Maxwell, not MLB, not the Players Association, nobody. And this kid was, like you said, Mercedes, was a target. It gives me chills. And you're going to make me cry. Because oh. what happened to him was not okay. And so when you say, was he going to get another opportunity? Yeah, MF and right. So what happened is get an opportunity in Mexico. Thank you, Monclova. Shout out, Monclova. Then um, he starts playing really well there. But mind you, we're, we're having to, to go through some things. We're having to get some help, you know? And I'm not a trained therapist, but again, I'll say it again. We, as women, when we tap into our power, we can get a whole lot done. And that includes on the psychological scale. And so the opportunity after that first year with Monclova started by getting him a workout with the Giants who were open and the Mets. That was before the BLM stuff started. Mm -hmm. Both teams wanted him, expressed interest in bringing him on at the same time that BLM happens. So at first we were incredibly nervous because mm -hmm. you didn't know the direction that it was going to go. Yeah. And so it could have hurt his chances like, up, oh, we can't bring him in because it's going to bring all that nonsense here. But thankfully, the Mets, the incredible team there, Allard Bear, all he's no longer there, might need a job. Um, he was incredible. And like I said, the Giants were incredible. When they came to see him, they were like, how does this this guy not have a job just based on ability alone when you have guys who are domestic abusers and worse that do have jobs. You had the opportunity to sign Bianca Smith. 
the yeah. first African American female coach working in a major league baseball for the Boston Red Sox. Why was it so important for you to have her as a client and to sign her and truly to make history with that signing? Yeah. She, um, you know, a, a lot hit her really fast. And I knew that she would not likely have the support that was necessary to maneuver in a system that is predominantly white, but also predominantly male. Having been in that um, situation, um, but I was afforded the opportunity to know lots of people or to immediately have access to a lot of people. I don't pretend to have walked in here and just done it all on my own. And I don't think that any of us do, no different than in any other profession or any other gender. Everyone needs support, everyone needs an ally. So I got worried because Bianca's experience would be very different than let's say Justine Segal, who I also represent. And so being able to help Bianca maneuver and, and ask questions, and you guys will understand this, so Bianca, they're going to provide you pants, girl, but, you know, I haven't seen your butt or your thighs, <laughs> you know, like, right? Because are we going to have to get like a size medium because she's tiny, but are we going to have to get like a medium altered to, a, you know, the height of a small? <laughs> things you don't think about. Yeah. Exactly. Things that you don't have to think about when you're just dealing with men. Player evaluation, girl. Player evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> and so with Bianca... It was inc in incredibly important also because, you know, it's very hard sometimes for us to find our voice in new environments. And I wanted to make sure that she felt empowered by what she knows. And one of the things that you saw early on is a lot of people focused solely on her being the first black woman. No one really asked her about her accomplishments to date, which she's an attorney. She went to law school. Um, but in addition to that, she went to Dartmouth. In addition to that, she's been coaching. In addition to that, she was a baseball player. Everyone assumes a softball player. In addition to that, she had scouted with the, or not scouted, but, you know, did an internship with the Reds. But most of all, how about we ask her what her, her philosophy is on coaching? How about we ask her what her philosophy is on hitting the things that she's being hired to do? So I wanted to make sure that that was heard. That is such a great point because I, I feel like um, in the industry, we're always talking about the first this, the first that. And at some point we have to get past, okay, it's the first, but what what is she doing? What yes. is he or she doing in, in the industry? And it's so important. And I'm so happy that you were able to, to guide her with that. And speaking of, us as, as women of color, you know, you were never surprised to see our achievements be a, a sidebar to those of white men and white women in the industry. How do you specifically, how do you deal with that? Um, I really hadn't had to deal with it until recently. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely unfortunate. And, um, you know, what's sad about it is that, you know, we've all been to this point very respectful of each other and in general you have an industry that is like a large family there are plenty of people in your own family that you don't like but there is just an either an underlying respect or there's an understanding of how you go about your business it's not necessary to discredit, devalue, or erase the accomplishments of others to make yourself look good. Ultimately, it will come back around. Everything reveals itself. You never know who you're going to need. Don't burn bridges. That's always my, my advice. Right, Julie? <laughs> All the time. Be nice to everyone. <laughs> Well, not everyone. Well, not every, <laughs> unless given reason not to. Always a free pass, unless they give you reason not to, and then you're dead to me. I'm a Scorpio. It's a water sign thing. <laughs> before, before we go, um, you know, everybody always asks uh, us as women in the industry, you know, what's the most difficult part? How, how difficult is it to deal with the men? But you know what? What's the easiest part? What's been the easiest thing for you to manage in, in your career so far? Being myself, 
That's the easiest thing that you could do and probably the best thing you could do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Best advice. Be yourself <laughs> and be nice to people. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Bianca. Yeah. Be, yeah. Be yourself no, but, unless you're an <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Be yourself unless you're an And then you got to fake it. Fake it. Fake being nice. We know a couple of those people in this industry. <laughs> yes. yes. I think I just opened it to one, but... <laughs> Bianca, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, congratulations on all of your success and hope to see you continue to, to grow uh, and, and be given the flowers that you so deserve in this industry. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to go in scared. I can't tiptoe around this profession. Uh, I have to let them know, like, I'm coming, but I'm coming with experience. I'm coming as a strong black woman and I'm coming to just kind of, and I can't curse on here, but I'm <laughs> coming to make a place for myself.